we have very little time to address all of these questions. If uh, there's a serious uh, intention to get us out, it's two minutes to eight. Oh, so, okay. um, Daniel, you want to? I, I think Ed, Eddie's uh, comments uh, deserve some response in terms of uh, you know the negative uh, remarks we made about actually existing trade unions, which. Yeah, no, I appreciate Brother Eddie's question because, you know, mostly my wobbly friends tell me I'm not negative enough. So now I get to tell them that, no, I, you know, uh, there is some negativity here. If you actually read the wobbly founding mothers and fathers and you read their descriptions of the craft unions at the time and the leaders, they reserve some of the harshest words for those folks, just as harsh and sometimes even harsher than the boss. They considered these folks labor misleaders. They consider these folks leading people into continued what they called weight slavery, um, which they argued had some connection actually to, to plantation slavery. Um, so there's no doubt um, uh, Stoughton really, who's my mentor and, and, and I, we do have a critique. Um, our critique, just so everyone knows, is not in the mainstream, and not even on the left or anywhere else. Um, we do think that uh, business unionism um, is a very key uh, factor in the decline of the labor movement. I think it's very relevant to this extremely fascinating, great question, um, this question of, well, you know, can't even keep workers together in this low impact model, but what is this low impact model? Let's tell a quick story about a worker in a right to work state I recently had the occasion to, to, to chat with, and he started working at, at a company, right? So he <laughs> can't automatically be put in the union. So his business union came and talked to him and his co-workers, new hires. You know what the pitch was? The sales pitch was you get discounts if you join our union, right? That you get discounts. You know, you get discount on your, you know, your car or whatever it is. Eyeglasses. <laughs> Eyeglasses. Um, while discounts, as cons you know, consumer discounts are great, um, I think we're looking, some of us are looking for a very different kind of unionism. So I guess to answer your question, I think, wait, what, where we may differ, and I think it was a really fascinating, well thought out question, is is where business unionism and the service provider model uh, it has really taken worker consciousness, um, because you have very little of that education part of the education uh, organization uh, and, and emancipation. Um, just so we're on the same page, um, cooperating with the existing unions. I, Pretty sure that my shoe leather on picket lines proves my commitment to standing in solidarity with, with workers who are in the traditional unions. Many close relationships work closely with some of the, the unions in New York all the time, every day, every week. Um, there's no question that solidarity must be uncompromising um, in, in that realm. Um, however, Occupy has opened up new possibilities, right? Occupy has allowed a critique that's been out there for a long time, but pretty much a voice in the wilderness to really look at the kind of unionism um, that we want, right? Do we want unionism that pumps millions of dollars into the Democratic Party, right? We don't like to talk about that. But that's a reality, right? Where so much of our dues money in the traditional unions go. Do we want it funding $300,000, $400,000 salaries of people who have never been employed on the shop floor, right? Um, I, I don't know. Some of us think that it can be something different. Um, I cannot in my mind's eye imagining, imagine the traditional trade unions we have currently in this country uh, being part of a, a, a really dramatic uh, fight. Don't take my word for it. A former senior executive at SEIU, uh, Stephen Lerner, wrote a piece on Indies Times. You can easily Google it. And Lerner himself concedes that due to the massive treasuries, due to the no strike clauses and all the other things we've been talking tonight about tonight, that unions in fact will not you know, be this sort of cutting edge uh, of the social justice movement um, that uh, uh, we hope it'll be. Let me pass it on to Sonia and Don and address some of the other problems. Okay. I think the one thing that came up that I think I really have any standing to respond to is the question of um, protections for workers who might be retaliated against um, based on their immigration status if they stand up for their rights at work. Um, and sort of technical, you know, there are some protections available um, to workers, um, you know, if their employers can report them to ICE 
on and they are put into the immigration system. Um, the U visa is, is one thing. It's, you know, there are a lot of um, advocates who've been, I don't know whether you guys have been doing U visas at Grand Rivers or looking for people to do. Look, I don't, can't have one yet. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's not the U, the U visa, the uh, temporary visa um, that leads to a path to citizenship of victims of crime. Um, and, um, you know, it involves um, the, it requires the cooperation of law enforcement in order to get the visa. Um, and it also requires harm uh, to the individual, to the victim of crime, um, you know, because of the crime. Um, and so there are a lot of parts. Um, and so, you know, you see the U visa a lot um, in, um, you know, for example, the domestic violence context. Um, and there are a lot of really amazing advocates who are pushing to, um, and, and also government agencies who are, are looking into ways to use the U visa to protect um, uh, victims of, of workplace exploitation. Um, but I think it's been tough um, as far as, as I understand. There's some other um, uh, protections available um, that the advocates have sort of clawed out. Uh, but again, they're sort of mixed um, in terms of, of other strength. Um, for Thank you. I'm going to make an effort at a closing remark. You know, uh, you mentioned Stone Lind. I, I assigned one of his essays, Another World's Possible, to my students uh, in uh, works rights under international law. We are sort of caught between the, the, the mantra that we get from the neoliberals, there is no alternative, T-I-N-A, we abbreviated. And, and the mantra, perhaps, of the social movements and perhaps the Occupy movement that another world is possible. But we're still caught in the real world that exists. We have to understand what its drawbacks are. Uh, I often say even a bad union is better than no union. But we have to get to another level so that we're, when we see a union that needs work, people begin to develop an understanding and a vision of what it might be. And self-activity, I, I can't emphasize enough, is very important. Law is a double-edged sword. Labor law is supposedly on the one hand providing protections, but as I say, it is channeling and therefore tamping down and suppressing worker self-activity. So this is a moment where we have to think of these issues, what are the pluses and minuses of existing unions, and what needs to get changed, and the fact that it has to get changed by the workers themselves, and we often say, from the bottom up, because we can't expect that folks that are running the existing regime are going to be the ones to be looking to transform it. Transformation has to come from below. Well said, Dom. Um, um, I, I don't want to forget your question. I think it was the two parts. It was also a really fascinating question. Just, just to clarify um, my remarks, it, it's not that NLRB, I think, was what you said. It's Taft-Hartley second, no, no problem. The Taft-Hartley secondary prohibitions bind unions, not workers, not community organizations that are not labor organizations. That being said, if you're an individual or if you're a community organization, you do have to be careful that you're not found to be an agent of a union because then you'll subject. Well, that's another issue, though those are hard to plead. Employers usually lose the RICO lawsuits. We got hit with one, we beat it. Um, what you will do if you're the agent is you'll subject the union to liability under Taft-Hartley as if they did it themselves. So make sure you don't get held to be an agent. We can talk more about what the test is for agency. With respect to nonprofit uh, worker centers, it's a fascinating topic um, in a nutshell. Um, again, I'm out of mainstream. I, I, I work at one of these things. I'm in that world of worker centers. I believe that worker centers are actually extremely imperfect uh, and should be temporary crutches um, in, in the movement. There's necessity for their rise, as Sony well knows. A lot of it was, frankly, exclusion of, of different workers, mostly immigrants, workers of color. Um, there have been some improvements in the mainstream movement around that. Um, but um, at the end of the day, look at a worker center, right? Look at the financing model. You always got to follow the money, brothers and sisters. Individual donors, typically not the members, not in large part, and private foundations. Most worker centers are absolutely, the huge overwhelming majority of their budget is from private foundations. 
That's not a democratic financing model. Worker centers do not have the track record of long-term power at work that labor unions do. There's no getting around that. Worker center communities to admit that. It's obvious, it's very clear from the record. Unions have a better record in that regard. On the other hand, unions, unfortunately, haven't been able to match, in many cases, the openness of worker center campaigns, the way they engage the imagination. Two years following the coalition of a Mobley worker campaign, small group of workers in Florida whose work is captivating the nation all over the media conferences. You see this amazing work, right? <laughs> Very little resources. So the worker center community has a, a role to play. Um, I think it's most profound, though, when it doesn't try to act in a vacuum, um, but acts as a partner, and hopefully a temporary partner, because there's no question that a superior financing model for a working class organization is the dues model, right? Of course, you want the worker's pocketbook to be the treasury, and that means you don't have to answer to anyone, and you have your worry about your life being turned out by a private foundation. Um, so my take on worker centers and nonprofits is temporary crutch role to help in certain respects Hopefully we can phase them out. Maybe the Occupy movement will, will, will help us uh, do that. I would just echo what Dom said in terms of my closing remarks. Um, I think the, the power to transform the workplace and, and society uh, really lies in the hands of, of workers themselves. Uh, to paraphrase the great wobbly Eugene Debs, he said, you know, if, I was, I'm, if I'm gonna lead you out of this hole or something of that nature, uh, you know, someone else will just lead you uh, back in. So I think we need to move away from the lawyers, we need to move away from the experts, and certainly the bureaucrats, um, and we have to return to labor movement, which is uh, based on a rank and file self-activity, direct action, and solidarity. So we just have a couple of announcements, and then um, everyone's free to go. Um, glad you brought up the coalition. Oh. <laughs>